Jennifer Butler is a composer, teacher, and flutist living in Vancouver, BC. Her music, described as beautifully remote by the Vancouver Sun, intimate by the Globe and Mail, and disquieting by the Vancouver Observer, has been commissioned, performed, and broadcast across Canada, the US, Australia, and Europe. She holds both a master's degree and a doctorate in music composition from the University of British Columbia. Over the past two pandemic years, she has completed several new works, including Walking in the Public Gardens After Rain, with poetry by Ray Crossman and commissioned by the Blue Ridge Chamber Music Festival. Songs for Clee Wick, commissioned by Victoria's Emily Carr String Quartet, with Marion Newman. Heartbeat of the Forest for Solo Vibraphone, commissioned by Katie Reif. And This Breath Between Us for Oboe and Bassoon, commissioned by Caitlin Coleman and Morgan Zentner. Jennifer teaches composition as a sessional instructor at UBC, and both 20th Century Theory and Composition at the Vancouver Academy of Music. For 16 months through the pandemic, in collaboration with the Kettle Society and Vancouver Opera, she led an online music and listening class that explored many aspects of sound making and creative wellness. She is currently the chair for the advisory committee for the BC region of the CMC, and is an active board member for Redshift Music and the Standing Wave Ensemble. She was president of the Canadian League of Composers from 2011 to 2014, and she was an active member of R. Murray Schaefer's Wolf Project from 2000 to 2016. Upcoming projects include a new commission from the Vancouver Island Symphony for mezzo-soprano and string orchestra, setting the poetry of Tina Biello. This will be performed in 2023 with Marion Newman as a soloist. Also, a commission from Redshift for the newest version of the Vertical Orchestra, this time for a large percussion ensemble spread throughout the enormous atrium of the downtown branch of the Vancouver Public Library, and a wilder place for Vancouver's Standing Wave Ensemble, created specifically for the new Standing Wave app. In collaboration with Chroma Mixed Media, Jennifer will create a site-specific piece for Vancouver's Spanish banks that will be accessed through our smartphones using GPS triggers to control the experience of the music. Jennifer has an upcoming album of her music entitled one More Way to See, which is the title of a poem by Stephanie McKenzie that appears in Songs for Cleewick. That album is being produced by Redshift Records. And now my interview with Jennifer Butler from my home studio in Vancouver, BC. I am Adrian Verdeo, host of the Redshift Radio podcast, recorded on the unceded territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and tsleil peoples. Jen, thank you so much for joining me here today. It's great to see you back in person. I know we just were chatting and it has been, it seems like way too long. So we do have a lot to catch up on. Uh, but firstly, thank you so much for stopping by today. It's great to see you again. Oh, it's so nice to be here. Yeah. And to see you in person. It's it's wonderful. Uh, last time I think you were over here was a few years ago and you're starting sketches for a piece that has now been recorded, premiered. And um, I do want to talk about your plans for your upcoming album. Um, however, uh, can you tell us a little bit uh, in general about uh, what you've been up to um, in the, not just in the last couple of years, but most recently, if you have some projects on the go, please uh, do tell us a little bit about the album as well. Sure. Yeah. Well, I guess we've all experienced a very strange couple of years. And um, as a composer, you know, compared to a lot of my performing friends, I've, I think, composition projects have continued at, at quite a steady pace. I found that when a lot of the performances shut down and concerts were canceled, a lot of people that I work with turned to commissioning, which was, um, and a lot of performers invented these amazing commissioning projects. So I felt really lucky that a lot of wonderful projects kind of fell into my lap. So, um, well, one of the first things that actually happened was, uh, yeah, that I got this Canada Council grant kind of right at the start of the pandemic, which is kind of a funny time to get a big Canada Council grant, but it was for uh, producing my first album of my music. So it's, uh, we, I actually just finished the final recording session for the for the CD. Uh, it's taken a long time because I had, I was working with a lot of local musicians, but also Mary Newman from Toronto. So we had to wait for her to feel comfortable to travel and line it up with uh, another gig that she had. And then I also worked with the Emily Carr String Quartet who were in Victoria. So it was sort of felt like every time we had planned to get together, there'd be a new wave of COVID and we weren't allowed to travel to the island or something like that. So it's taken a quite a while to put together, but it's been really rewarding to have a project like that through the pandemic to work on. And, and it gave me a chance to connect with some of my favorite musicians and favorite people as well, which was always really fun. And, um, and then also because of the pandemic, my original plans for the CD uh, 
compared to what has eventually been recorded also changed quite a lot. Um, in the beginning, they were all vocal pieces, a lot of pieces that kind of brought together musicians that maybe don't work together regularly. And of course, because of COVID, it just it just made sense to work more with like a single voice or musician groups and musicians that were already uh, in each other's bubbles. And so um, I think actually the result is that it's it's a much more meaningful album for me. I chose pieces that I'd um, written maybe during the pandemic even that hadn't had a chance to air yet. So there's a few pieces that have never actually been performed that are or have had just one performance, but you know haven't really had a ch- have had haven't had a chance for a life yet. Um, so that was really meaningful to kind of take those pieces to a new place. Uh, yeah. So one of the the first recording session was with with you and with uh, Mark McGregor and Dory Haley. And it was a song cycle that I wrote. Sonic Boom in 2020 was cancelled, so it must have been 2019. And uh, yeah, but to record them all finally was so rewarding. And um, that was a piece I worked on with Peter Anderson, who I've worked with uh, on several projects. And he's he's really one of my favorite collaborators. And it's called uh, Four Horses. And it's all kind of uh, this, this kind of modern take on the four horses of the apocalypse. And it's all about the sort of well it's really timely actually it's it's about the apocalypse and and uh sort of this crisis um that we we always feel like we're on the edge of and our re- and our human response to it and then yeah now we're kind of in that crisis or one one part of it anyways um it's it's very interesting actually several pieces on the album uh I wrote before the pandemic started but they have a whole new I don't know, meaning to them. So there's a solo piano piece I wrote called Shelter, which was really about um, when we go through a tough time, kind of that feeling that we have of drawing inward and finding a safe place. Um, But then that term shelter gained this much deeper meaning for all of us uh, during the pandemic, right? And taking shelter and what does that mean? And so that was really interesting to then record that piece, even though I wrote it beforehand, but I recorded it during the pandemic and it had this whole new meaning. Um, and then, yeah, the, the last piece that I just recorded two weeks ago, actually with, with Mark McGregor and the Emily Carr string quartet, I also wrote before the pandemic, but it's called the end of the world and then in brackets or else the beginning. And it's, uh, was written as a tribute to Murray Schaefer and yeah, that just that title, that, you know, the end of the world feeling, which I think we've all kind of pondered in the last couple of years, um, also has this whole new meaning that, than what I meant originally, but it's, it's yeah, there's a sort of deeper thing. So it's it's kind of interesting that these themes have... Yeah, have, kind of evolved and yeah. uh, taken new new meaning, like you said. Specifically with Four Horses and your collaboration with Peter, uh, is the text referring to an environmental crisis or specifically uh, more of a kind of a social um, crisis in that, or is it a more kind of a general statement? Um, how, uh, how does the, the poetry reflect the music? Yeah, it's all of those. Um, so it begins with a flood, you know, which has like that biblical reference. Um, but if you if you live in Vancouver, lately we've experienced just, you know, this year has, has been just record-breaking floods. Um, so that's like an environmental statement for sure. Uh, there's, there's comments um, in the poetry about, you know, just consumption and waste and how, you know, even though we know climate change is this impending disaster, we choose to drive five blocks instead of, you know, walking or taking the bus or something like that. So there's there's all these little things kind of woven into this text. So it's, a, yeah, there's a lot of comments about just, just our wastefulness as humans or our consumption, uh, you know, these, th- this sort of how we just continue to take these actions out of ritual or out of inertia, even though we know you know, really the science behind what's happening to us. But it's all written in this very um, beautiful, beautiful sort of images of poems. And then the last one is like, you know, we saw the earth from outer space. And like, it's all about this image of like looking at at the earth. And I think, you know, that's referencing um, when astronauts talk about that experience of going out into out into space and then turning around and looking at, at earth. And you just sort of see it as this vulnerable single planet that has this amazing life on it and yet you know we don't we don't cherish it enough i think and and i think a lot of astronauts have gone through that emotional experience so the last poem is really about that that kind of perspective on like here's what we've been given and what are we going to do with it so yeah it's it's a really interesting 
set of poetry. There's a lot of depth to it. And the more that I read it, and th- those poems, and the more I listen to it, the more I kind of get out of it. But it's also because Peter's a very funny person. So there's also little moments of humor in it. And there's lots of wordplay. So it's, yeah, there's a lot of different layers. I know you mentioned uh, Murray Schaefer and uh, some of the themes you're mentioning regarding this piece. And I know in general with your body of work, uh, reference certain environmental themes and, you know, climate change, uh, the natural world. And certainly that's a, a, a big motive in Murray Schaefer's music. And I know that some of his installations, uh, specifically the Wolf Project, I wanted to ask you about. Did that project and your involvement with that project influence your voice as a composer? Um, did it um, give you inspiration to find collaborators that were like-minded in that regard? Uh, more so, I'm curious to know more about that project, Jennifer, and uh, when you were involved with that and some of your more memorable experiences. Wow, that's a big question. I, yeah, I could yeah. probably fill up two hours. No, I will, I will try not to. Um, yeah, so... I began attending uh, the Wolf Project, as it's most commonly known, but it's officially known as And Wolf Shall Inherit the Moon. And it's actually the epilogue to Murray's Patria Cycle, which is a 12 opera cycle, which he began writing in the 60s. And um, it's a very complex story that involves two main characters, the princess and the wolf. And so the, the prologue is The Princess of the Stars, which is a quite a, his, one of his best known um, environmental operas. And... Um, and then in in the middle uh, of of between the Princess of the Stars and the Wolf Project are sort of ten operas, which continue the story of the Princess and the Wolf, where they travel through all these different times and places. And then um, and then the epilogue is the Wolf Project. I first found out about it, I guess, in about 1998, and I was living in Ontario, and uh, it was at the Open Ears Festival. One of the, I think maybe the first Open Ears Festival, which was started by Peter Hatch, who was one of my teachers at Laurier. And uh, I think Murray Schaefer gave the keynote address that year, and he talked about the Wolf Project, but he talked about it in this way of like, everyone knows about the Wolf Project. So he didn't really explain what it was. He would just say, oh, and the wolves. And there were several people at the festival that year who were also attendees of the Wolf Project. And it, it seemed like this little group. And Everything I heard about it, it was very mysterious to me, but everything I heard about it just caused me to get kind of goosebumps and think, what is this project? Um, people like Ellen Waterman and um, Gail Young and um, and her partner, Reiner uh, Reisenstein, and I'm sure there are others that I'm forgetting, but... Um, they, they, it was just this thing that happened in the wilderness and it was music making and Murray Schaefer was involved. And I was like, how do I, how do I learn about this? So after that, I approached Gail and I asked her about it. And, um, but at that point I had actually moved already back to the West coast. And, uh, at that time, the Wolf Project was at its kind of peak or it's, it, it was really uh, a strong project. Murray was still young enough that he was really leading the way with it. And, um, and it was uh, the attendance was full, which is uh, it's designed for um, 68 people. So eight groups of eight uh, kind of go into the woods and produce art for eight days. Eight is apparently Murray's one of his favorite numbers. And so I ended up finding two sponsors because you had to find sponsors to get involved in Victoria. And they talked me all to, you know, they taught me all about what the project was about. And that's when I learned a lot more. That's when I was kind of given my first copy of the script. And, um, and then you have to write a letter. And, you know, if you're really interested and you've gone to that kind of effort and you've written your letter, pretty much you were going to be welcomed in. So the first year I attended was actually the year 2000. And I attended for 12 years. Um, I missed a few in there, but over the period of 16 years, I attended 12 times. So it was a huge part of my life and a huge part of my development as a composer. Um, absolutely, because it takes place uh, deep in the wilderness in, in a Halliburton Forest, which is a privately owned wilderness preserve um, that um, that the project has been given special permission to use each summer. And um, so there's no one else there. And it's, it's, 
spread out over a huge amount of space. So there are four different sites uh, where we're divided into groups of 16. So two different groups at each, two different groups of eight camped together. And from our site, like our site was called Crow Lake. Uh, I think the actual name was No Name Lake, but we renamed it Crow Lake because each group is named after one an animal, an animal that's indigenous to that area. And um, so for from us to the nearest site for a average hiker or walker would have been an hour and a half walk. So we're very spread out and we and through the week we don't interact with each other that much. So you're really with your group of 16. And um and then uh yeah, and there were four sites and there was sort of one site that was a main site in the middle that we would all gather together for at the end of the week to produce the final show, which is when we tell the final story. But through the week, yeah, we camp together, we eat together, we perform rituals, which were, many of them were originally designed by Murray, but over the decades, uh, lots of new people have come up with rituals as well. They're rituals that tend to just highlight a moment in time. So like we have a sunrise or a morning ritual, a sunset ritual. There's a ritual for the very end of the night when the campfire is dying um, and that signals the time when no one's allowed to speak any well I mean there's rules but they're they're all there's no like police I mean but we're not supposed to speak it's just to honor silence of course which was something very important to Murray um, and in the morning too you're not you're not supposed to make a lot of noise until um, until the morning ritual happens just to honor that silence of course if you're on breakfast duty there is a lot of, like talking, um, which happens, but yeah, so it's, it's a, it's a time spent, uh, with this group in, in nature, which is extremely intense. You spend the first four days with your group pre- creating a new piece of work, artwork. It's kind of like a music theater, dance, whatever, whoever's there, whoever, whatever talents they have, they bring to it. Uh, there's a lot, usually acting and poetry and movement and you're using the wilderness space and you kind of put together this little show and each group is assigned a different part of the Patria story to kind of tell. And then on uh, days sort of five and six, we travel around and, and, uh, view each of these performances and it's a lot of hiking of course because you're kind of you kind of hike for an hour and a half and then you watch like these two shows and then you hike to the next one and then you watch the next two shows and then you have to hike all the way home so you, it's a pretty exhausting day um and then maybe the next day you're performing yours in the morning and then you have to hike to the other place and watch them in the afternoon and come back and then you still have to make dinner and you know you're like in deep wilderness where well, you're intense and yeah. all of that so um it changes your your listening like that. I think that for me was the most profound thing. Like you're, a lot of these encounters that are created, you know, you'll be walking through the woods with a group of people that you've been camping with all week. And maybe you're talking, maybe you're singing together, maybe you're walking in silence. And then suddenly you'll hear like an instrument in the forest playing something. And, and everyone's just just deeply listening to that and and or um someone will just be up in a tree and and watching you and but they'll be in costume and they'll be in character and and it just changes the way that you think about theater it changes the way you think about sound it changes the way you think about art so over those 12 years i just saw so many things that were different from anything i'd seen before and also it changes the way that you feel that music and art uh, what role they play in your life, because there it's all about community building. Uh, about half of the participants are professional musicians or active musicians, and then the other half are like children and spouses, or maybe they're theater directors, or maybe they're visual artists, but everyone participates in everything. So everyone sings, everyone dances, everyone um speaks poetry, everyone tells stories at the campfire. And so you expand your set of skills, you realize that singing together and just gathering together and observing a sunset is a really powerful thing. And so it's it's brought into my music that feeling of wanting to create really special places, like really special listening experiences. Um, I'm really intrigued by the the act of ritual and creating things that make us feel like we're part of a ritual or we're doing something together. So it's, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's been one of the most influential things I'd say in my development. Uh, speaking of um, your background as a composer and some of the experiences that led you into where you are right now. Um, I know that uh, growing up you were a flutist and you're also, you're 
still actively a flutist, also a, a music educator. You teach composition and flute. Um, I assume you started on flute, Jennifer. Uh, and uh, if so, at, at about what age uh, was flute your first instrument? Uh, and also, um, was it a choice? And if so, what drew you to the flute? I'm always interested to, to kind of know how certain personalities are uh, kind of drawn towards specific instruments. So if you can tell us a bit about the flute. It's funny how, yeah, we choose our instruments when we're so young. Um, and then I always say, like, if, if I could pick again now, like, as in my adult form, I'd probably be a violist or something. Like that. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, I I started taking music classes um, when I was really young, like Kodai classes. And I think it was just, like, a bunch of parents at my preschool found out about this Kodai class. I grew up in Victoria, and there was a very strong Kodai program at the conservatory there. And I think my mom was like, sure. Why don't we do that? Okay, that, that would be fun. So I did it. And right away, I really took to it. I loved it. And um, as part of Kodai, they teach recorder. That's a big part of That's the first instrument that they introduce. And I I think I just, my teacher just saw that I, I really loved it. And I really took to recorder. And she was the one who actually recommended flute. But right, right away, I was like, that's a great idea. I love that idea. Um, with flute, I mean, with most wind instruments, you can't start too young because the instruments are big and they're hard to hold. So nine tends to be the age that's recommended. And, and I know there are special flutes that you can get for younger kids, but I really think nine is a great age to start. And that's the age I started. And as a teacher, I, I tend to recommend that because you're just, you're big enough that it's not, it's not going to be so frustrating for you. And the, you know, coordinating your breathing with your fingers and learning to read music, like it's all very challenging with younger, with younger kids. Um, and so, yeah, I started at age nine and I did, I loved it. I played flute, but you know, even in high school, I was really drawn to contemporary music, which was very unusual. Most flute repertoire is 19th century. Like that was the really the glory days of the flute. And so much of the really, the flute repertoire that people think of when they think of the flute is from the 19th century. And I was always drawn to the really weird 20th century stuff. So I was Quite early on, Peg just like, oh, you're that person who likes that weird music. Yeah. But I never thought of composing in those days. Like, I really was um, drawn to, to flute. So I, when I went to university, I went as a flute performance major. And I really thought the trajectory of my life was to play in an orchestra. And um, I especially love playing piccolo. So I thought, that's what I'll do. Um, and then I went to uh, Wilfrid Laurier University. Um, which was a great place, but I didn't know this, but they also have an amazing composition program uh, that had nothing to do with why I picked Laurier. But in my first year, I needed an elective. And it was just this weird coincidence of all these strange factors where I didn't know anyone in Waterloo. I'd never been to Laurier before. I actually did my audition in Toronto and, and I just arrived there and I was trying to pick out an elective. And it was like the days before there was like teleregistration or internet or anything like that. So it was like, you actually had to physically go around to different classrooms and ask if there was space in the classes for an elective. And none of the electives I wanted had any space. And then I ran into this this musician that I knew from Victoria, Nathan Gage, he was a bass player and he had gone off to McGill a few years before. He was a really good bass player, a jazz musician. And he's like, I just transferred to Laurier because I want to be a composer. And Laurier has this amazing composition program. You should take composing. And I was like, what? No, <laughs> I can't be a composer. <laughs> um, uh, and, you know, he kind of convinced me. So I signed up for a first year composition. And, and uh, by the end of that first year, I was just yeah, I had found a new community of people that I really felt in sync with. I'd found sort of a a place for this creativity that I had that I, you know, hadn't really used in a while. And uh, so I began a double major. And, but then by my fourth year, I had a completely uh, turned around and, and I dropped the performance major and I, I decided I wanted to focus on composing. So it was like quite a fast and rapid, but very complete transformation. And... Um, and I, I still believe it was a really good choice for me as a, as a person. Like, I mean, I do love performing and I do love making music, but I also, I, I suffered from a lot of stage fright and I found it really stressful. And uh, yeah, I, I found it hard to perform music that I didn't really love. And I, t I tend to really gra gravitate more towards the 20th century music. So um, yeah, it was a great fit for me. 
Uh, did you find as a performer that you uh, used the flute as your initial ways of sketching out compositions? Did you kind of, uh, did you have a, any background in improvisation or, or um, more of a, was the flute kind of like your main uh, focus for composition winds and, and uh, flute orchestral instruments? Or did you start uh, with other instruments not to be too biased towards your own, which is always kind of an interesting kind of a double-edged sword. I think if you know an instrument so well, you might be tempted to write in a way that is kind of the way you play, or I know that for guitar composers specifically, yeah. but interested to know your background with that. Yeah, I, I agree with you completely that when you write for an instrument that you know how to play really well, you tend to fall into more familiar patterns, right? Um, and I do use the flute for composing. I don't remember in the early days what I did, actually, but I did write a lot of music for flutes because most of the colleagues that I knew the best were flute players and I wrote for myself um, because then it was easy to find a performer. Um, and even still, like a lot of my best friends, like Mark McGregor, he's he's a good friend and we, I think, our friendship formed because I'm a flute player and a composer. Um, and he's, but he's turned into a, like a wonderful collaborator as well. Um, I'm definitely comfortable writing for flute. I definitely find I can be more adventurous because I'm so aware of the limits and and the bounds of the instrument and wind instruments in general. Like I do feel like that's my comfort zone. I understand about breathing and it might be why I love writing for voice as well because there's this connection there for sure. And then when I have to write for a string instrument, it's, it's like an alien territory, you know? <laughs> yeah. Even now, even though I have a lot more experience writing for strings, it's like it's still uh, this this psychological kind of hump I have to move over before yeah. I'm like, wait, wait, I, I know how to do this. Um, but yeah, and and for sure, I mean, I think there was definitely a period where I didn't use the flute on purpose because I felt like pa certain patterns would just come out, which I didn't really want. So I actually used the piano, which I, I'm a terrible piano player, but I love using the piano as a tool for composing because I don't have patterns in my hands that, that are normal. I haven't spent hours practicing scales or arpeggios or anything on piano. So so when I play piano, I play a lot of wrong notes, but then those wrong notes sometimes become the right notes. And, and I kind of love that exploration. Um, but I do notice lately that when I've been writing vocal lines, I play them on flute because I just, and I, and I sing a lot when I compose too, because I, there's something very natural about that. And the connection there is really strong and, and just feeling like the sense of phrasing or the sense of like how things connect or pacing comes, comes really, uh, I, I, I learn a lot from playing through it on the instrument, which is nice. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about your work with, especially with singers uh, and your attraction to writing for voice? Um, I imagine it's kind of the, the typical collaborative relationship where you get to know a singer, maybe get to know them personally or admire their work, or in some cases, I'm sure they approach you for commissions as well. But uh, you mentioned a little bit kind of the elements of phrasing in that. Uh, what are the other elements of voice particularly that are so attractive to you in your writing um i know you have um a few, as you mentioned a few pieces with uh, featuring voice on your upcoming album yeah on the album i was lucky to to work with both marian newman um great mezzo soprano and dory haley who's one of my favorite sopranos to work with um it's it's interesting because i i didn't consciously say like wow i really want to start writing pieces for voice but about three years ago i was looking over over my work, my recent work, and I thought, wow, I've just written about six uh, six works for, for, and they've all been for voice in different ways. And I realized that they were the projects that I was really drawn to. Um, I think that my big in was actually through, through text. Like I really love collaborating with writers and I love collaborating with text. I think that when you start with a piece of text, um, for me, it's really inspiring. Like I, I, especially with the right text, I, I can read a certain poem and just a lot of ideas are already there for me with the, with, you know, I spend a lot of time choosing poetry and poets and there's certain poets now that I've worked with several times. Um, actually right now I'm, I'm working on a piece for uh, Mezzo Soprano and String Orchestra, which has been commissioned by the Vancouver Island Symphony and Marian Newman's going to be singing that as well and um, the assignment was to work with uh, a poet from Nanaimo, uh, Tina Biello and she sent me a whole bunch of her poems and I also found one of her books in the library and I read through the whole book and I loved her poetry and I, I read through all the poems that she sent me and I really loved these poems but 
it took me a while to find poetry that really it kind of leapt off the page and, and into the the music world. So uh, for me, a lot of it is just finding that poem, finding those words that really mean something. But there's also something about the sounds of the words and the way they're put together that that suddenly suddenly it becomes music in my in my head in this kind of non tangible way until I work on it for months and months. But um, but I but I finally did. I found a few poems that really spoke to me. And part of it was I think in this sort of two years of pandemic and then with the Ukrainian war and with all the climate disaster, a, a lot of her poetry is about heartbreak and um, a, a sort of devastation of watching a parent get ill. And I just, I think at other times I would have leapt at some of those poems, but right now I just wanted something a little more uplifting. So it took me a while to find just the right poems. So a lot of it starts with the text and and then and then the voice, um, for sure. Uh, most of the time now when I'm commissioned, I know the performers right at the start, which is really a nice luxury, especially with a singer, because one of the things about singers is, yeah, they're so unique in in a way that, I mean, I think all musicians, once they get to a high level, are very unique. You know, each flute player is different. Each violinist is different. Each guitarist is different and brings something really unique about who they are. That's what makes them, um, you know, successful and, and wonderful performers. But the voice is even, there's even that extra quality, right? Because it's not filtered through an, in, an instrument that's external. So each singer, I mean, immediately you hear that voice and you know who it is, which isn't always the case with an instrumentalist. And so, yeah, being able to, to know who you're writing for can really make a big difference. Um, I wrote a piece last summer for, for which was originally supposed to be for Dory, uh, but but before I even started composing, um, she knew she wouldn't be able to. So then I wrote for Heather Posey. So that was a really wonderful experience as well. So, I mean, each of these singers brings a whole different tool kit to the, to the table. And it does take a while to get to know that voice and take some experimenting. And if you're lucky, um, you'll get to workshop these, these pieces with them. And, and I would say with my vocal works, they all go through transformations after I hear the singer sing with them, or I always want feedback from the singer because singers are also really more than other instrumentalists, very particular about like this leap doesn't feel great or approaching that note from this interval, you know, would sound better if it was like this, or this word is really hard to produce. And, and I always learn so much from the, from the singers that I work with. Um, every time I work with a different singer, <clears throat> I, sorry, I learn something new. And that's, yeah, that's that's a really valuable thing. Yeah, it's interesting that, um, like you said, every singer has a very unique color and, and kind of personality in their musicianship. Uh, but moreover, not always specifically like a technical thing or a range necessarily, but really just a kind of a, a stylistic uh, way of interpretation that does take time to get to know, you know, I think... Um, also, from the performer side of things, like the longer you spend getting to know a composer and also getting to know their style, you know, the more kind of um, more hand in glove the relationship and sort of the, the outcome is. Um, so I imagine some, you know, like you mentioned, Dory having collaborated with her and we're all very grateful that she decided to move back to Vancouver recently as well. Uh, I know we just recorded something with her last month um, with Vancouver Intercultural uh, Orchestra. Um, and uh, beyond uh, sort of the familiar instruments, Jennifer, have you been approached by other um, instruments from other cultures or uh, you know, um, musical cultures, um, even, you know, in the Western tradition, but um, uh, other styles or people from other performing um, backgrounds or uh, conventions that have approached you um, to kind of uh, go outside of the traditional classical concert world or, or not? But uh, curious to know if you have... Uh, any kind of outside the box collaborations that uh, have come up recently? Yeah, you know, I haven't done as much of that as I, I kind of wish that I had. Um, I have, I did like for Murray Schaefer's 80th birthday, I wrote a choral piece that was really written for a group of singers that weren't professional singers, you know, so that was a really interesting project. Um, a poet that I met through through the Wolf Project, Ray Crossman, is he's a poet that I've collaborated with on several projects as well. And he approached me to write a piece for Murray Schaefer's 80th birthday. And 
yeah, so that was one place where I got to have a lot of fun and I got to throw in a lot of things um, that that I knew that kind of like that group, a group of really enthusiastic performers, but maybe who weren't trained singers or who weren't even people who sang in choirs regularly could have fun with. Um, I did write a piece. I wrote a piece for this, for the jazz festival that was commissioned by the Western Front for this huge percussion instrument that I think Martin Fisk and probably someone else um, that I'm forgetting uh, built. And it was like, the quadra marimbala phone or something like that. Oh, wow. <laughs> and it was this huge wooden box filled with like pots and pans. And then these like homemade marimba kind of like instruments in the middle. And it was for bass trombone and four percussionists. And as they were playing, they made lemonade at the same time. So that was written into the score that like now you dump in the sugar and now you add the water and now oh, you cool. squeeze the lemon and now you pour it all together. And so then, and it was for like the, they had a children's kind of corner at the, at the jazz festival or it was called like Sonic Playground, I think. And, and so they performed it throughout the day a few different times and all these kids would come. And then when they weren't performing, the kids were allowed to, to bang on the pots and pans with mallets and stuff. Oh, it's quite fun. <laughs> and then, yeah, at the end of the performance, then there were four pitchers of lemonade that they could serve. And it was quite, it was, that was one of the most hilarious pieces I've ever written. And, oh, and, and it ended with the, uh, the bass trombonist, uh, the, the, the bass trombone melody was all kind of, a riff off and and, and I, I let him improvise a lot because he was a really good improviser on Nick Knack, um, Nick Knack Paddywhack, you know that song? So um, I think it was called Nick Knack Lemon Whack. So he finished his last little riff and then he ran out with a big mallet and smashed a lemon on the grass. <laughs> and anyway, so that piece was performed like 10 times oh, cool. over two years. Um, and it's, it's one of my most performed pieces and it's also the strangest piece. So there's one that I definitely stepped out of the box for. Um, I did write a piece for Vico for String Quartet and Santour, which was the first time I'd really engaged with an instrument from a really, a very different culture and a very different perspective. And um, Sina, do you know yeah. Sina? Yes, Sina, the Santourist. She's an amazing performer. And, um, but I think, in the in the beginning she hadn't played music that was pulseless very often and that was a really new thing for her and my music tends to be quite pulseless mm -hmm. and uh it was really challenging for her that first rehearsal i remember um you know trying to coordinate with the string quartet and having no pulse to really guide her and yet it's very it's very specifically notated so you have to count very carefully but there carefully but there's no real pulse to guide you and the time signature is shifting and there's a lot of flux in time um but then by the time she performed it, it she'd really worked hard on it. It was it was a really um, amazing performance, and she, I know she's performed it a few times since then. So that was a really interesting experience for me to write for a totally new instrument, and and I collaborated with her, and she taught me a lot about the instrument. Um, but then to bring in the the quartet is yeah, it's a very interesting uh, experience when you when you bring some some something so rooted in like Western classical music as the string quartet and then bring in this other instrument. That was actually for an amazing concert where I don't know how many composers were part of it, but uh, a, a whole set of composers, maybe eight or 10, were each paired with uh, this string quartet plus one. And and it was a variety of, comp of instruments that were the soloists from different cultures. And it happened... The, the concert happened very soon after there was that bombing in Paris many, many years ago. And there was a lot of um, distrust and anger and sort of cross-cultural angst at that time. And then this beautiful concert happened with that brought together all these instruments from different parts of the world with the string quartet and all these collaborations that it had. I don't know. It was very moving yeah. to, to experience that. So I think these kinds of collaborations are going to happen more and more. I think that they're really important. I think their music is this amazing, powerful, amazingly powerful tool to communicate with, with people, you know, in different ways. And, um, and culture is, uh, music is such a big part of our different cultures and it's so, it's so meaningful to us. So, yeah. Also knowing that you are an educator and I'm sure you work a lot with younger students as well, um, at least as a flute instructor, but I know that recently you've um, taken on a post at UBC and you also teach at the Vancouver Academy of Music uh, in composition and other classes. Uh, I'm curious to know about your work as an educator, Jen, um, how 
you introduce contemporary idioms to young people um, and older people as well. But uh, you know, I'm sure that uh, they're very curious about your music. And um, how have you how have you also um, found your experience teaching at the post secondary level in the last year? Yeah, it's it's well, it's been so much fun. I mean, I remember when I was first approached uh, by Dorothy Chang and she asked if I would be interested. And I, as, as often happens with me, when I get asked to do something like that, I think, well, why me? Like, what do I have to bring to this? And then, and then I began to think about it more and more and more and get more excited about it and realize that really over the past uh, couple decades, I've been collecting all these ideas of things I would love to do with beginning composers. And um, so, so I had a really fun time doing this. I, I, uh, in the last few years, I've had a few chances to work with groups of young composers. So I, I led the uh, Jean Coulthard String Quartet readings uh, with the CMC a few years ago, and then I also uh, was a mentor with the Standing Waves Compicon um, a couple of years ago as well. That was online, so that was during the pandemic. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then this last year, I taught the first year composition class at UBC for the first time. And I also um, was a mentor for the Okanagan Symphony composition class. That was a group of seven high school students, uh, with which ended in a reading session with the Okanagan Symphony, uh, many of them who had never even composed before, and then, you know, came up with an orchestra piece, which was quite astounding. Wow. Um, and yeah, and then I'm teaching a 20th century composition, or sorry, not composition, a 20th century theory class at the Vancouver Academy. So it's all sort of, yeah, this task of like introducing people to the realm of of 20th century music, to composition, to uh, thinking about music in a different way than most of them ever have. I mean, uh, in in my first class, I I usually do a few different things. So I always get to know them a little bit, of course. And one of my questions is always like, what is the music that you love? Like, what do you, um, what composers are your favorite composers? What music is your favorite music? And I always encourage them to include something from the 20th century. And I, I say, it absolutely could be a movie soundtrack or a band. Like, in fact, I, I love to know about that more than I want to hear about their love for Tchaikovsky. Um, but it's amazing how at that level first year composition or or first year students or or my even my fourth year theory students um, or the high school students I hear Sibelius and Tchaikovsky a lot these are their favorite composers and and very few of them have a, a big context of mu of understanding of music in the 20th century or 21st century and so it's 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 really interesting to to sort of introduce them to all this music um, I do it really differently with the composers and with the, th the theory class, but sort of the end result, I think is my goal is the same, is that I want them to find music that they love. And there's so much diversity in the 20th century that I'm convinced that everyone can find music that they'll love. Although a few students have held out on me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're really committed to, to the music they came into the course loving. Um, but the other thing that I really love to do with uh, especially young composers is introduce them to a sort of a listening practice. And, and that absolutely comes from my experience with Murray Schaefer, but also my... Um, just my admiration for the work of Pauline Oliveras and... and uh, my experience is going on sound walks when I was a young composer. So with my composition class at UBC, at the very first class of the year and the very last class of the year, we actually went on a long sound walk together and walked around the UBC campus and just listened. And um, I asked them to write journals about that experience. And several of them said, you know, in the beginning, when we went out on that sound walk, I really didn't know what to expect. And I thought that I was really embarrassed to be walking around in this big group of silent people. And, um, you know, some kids in the class really got into it right away and started making sounds with rocks and like playing with the environment and and others were were very uh shy about it and when but the the feedback that I got from that journal just made me realize I was really on the right track with that um because almost every single one of them said that they had a listening experience that they had never had before they'd never done something like that before and it really tuned them into the, the world of sound around them. So that was that was great. And, and so that's definitely something that I think is important for all young composers. And then just just giving them a context for the music that they're writing outside of video game music and outside of film music and outside of what they might hear on the radio, which can be really interesting, wonderful music, absolutely. But it's also tends to be uh, quite narrow. Uh, 
you know, the the kinds of sounds, the kinds of harmonies, the kinds of rhythms that you're going to encounter in that music are going to be much more narrow than you're going to than 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 the possibilities available. So a big part of what I did in the class this year was kind of forcing them uh, outside of their comfort zone. And I'd say uh, every single student in my UBC class really stepped outside of their com- comfort zone at some point and took big risks and I consider that one of my biggest successes that that I created a space where they felt they could do that. Um, I was really lucky that I also had a a hangover from before the pandemic in that I had been collaborating with the Turning Point Ensemble on an education project that ended up not working out. So then I was able to bring that collaboration into my UBC class. So in the fall, the students actually got to write pieces for members of the, of the Turning Point Ensemble, which is one of Vancouver's top new music ensembles. Yeah. So these brand new composers um, for their second project wrote uh, a solo piece for one of five members of Turning Point that that volunteered. And then for their, their third project, they wrote duets. So then it was this amazing um, thing where they each brought in a student, an advanced student. So then the students in my class wrote duets for the professional player and the student to perform together. Um, so it was this, this incredible like learning environment where everyone was learning. Um, so because of that, though, they got to really stretch their wings as composers because, you know, you can, you can write you can really experiment and you can try things and you're going to get so much feedback from a professional player, which you probably won't get from a student performer. Oh, totally. So they were really, that was really lucky. But I, because of that, like I wouldn't let them even touch the piano. They they had to write for this totally alien instrument, you know? Um, and, and because of that, I think it, it freed them in a sense to, to step outside of the box. And then after Christmas, it was like, online again so I created a project where they had to use found percussion objects in their house and they had to create a video of their composition and some of them really just created these amazingly creative videos uh, and and crazy percussion pieces out of objects in their house and they all had a deeper meaning I was really blown away by by the effort that they put in and then finally they were allowed to write for piano, but then I gave them a list of, <laughs> of, of rules. Yeah. So it was like, you have to, you have to pick at least two things off this list and include the, these things just not because there's anything wrong with writing a really simple tonal piano piece, not at all. Yeah. But at that stage in composing, I think it's important to realize you can do other things too, and to just be pushed outside of your comfort zone. And I know that my teachers did that for me in my undergrad. They'd sort of see me settling into a particular style. Oh, you've written a few pieces and it sounds lovely, but like now you have to do this. And it was like something completely different. So I was always trying to nudge them in new directions um, just to simply show them that they can. Because I think when you're starting out, yeah, you don't want to get too comfortable too quickly. Um, You know, and, and I think most of us, who are working in creative fields, we do that to ourselves as well all the time, right? We're like, you know, oh, this feels a little too comfortable. I'm going to try this or I want to go after that new thing or learn about this new thing. That's what keeps it interesting. Yeah, it keeps us on our toes for sure. And what a great opportunity for your students. Um, Wondering as a flute instructor, if you have, uh, when you encounter younger students or students of any age, um, and also given that the flute and the pedagogy and the methods are so kind of set, you know, like the path is laid out for you. If you want to study flute, the, you know, the repertoire is there. Um, and you could probably go pretty far without exploring new music or contemporary idioms. But uh, do you take it as a sort of a personal duty to open your students' eyes to kind of this world of flute music, this pretty wide world of flute music, as I'm discovering work with, with Mark, you know, how much great stuff there is out there. Um, uh, and do you have some students that are really engaged and really fascinated by new music? Uh, it must be kind of rewarding if you do. Yeah, no, I don't. I mean, mostly I work with young, really young, and I wish I could say that I had been successful in introducing some of them to contemporary music, Um, but that hasn't really been the case. Um, I mean, I always try and provide a perspective about music history to them, which I think is a little bit unconventional, Uh, and, and, and I always... You know, I do similar kinds of things where I encourage a lot of listening along with learning the instruments. But yeah, I do tend to fall upon the pedagogy that I was brought up with. And I was, you know, I was, I went through that really conventional upbringing on my instrument. And it, it, so it, it is what I introduce them to as well. I've had a few students who've been a little higher level that I have, but it takes a lot more work to introduce that as a, to a performer. It's interesting. Yeah, Um, Yeah. There, there's, 
because I guess because it's so physical and a lot of contemporary music demands new techniques of you and demands a new like you've spent so long learning how to play something in a really tight pulse and suddenly it's like okay now there's no bar lines and you're free and that's a really hard leap for students sure. to take yeah um yeah i have a student now who's she's preparing for a grade six exam and she's doing a great job and i did introduce her to a lot of because the the royal conservatory of music now um forces you to play contemporary repertoire yeah. and canadian repertoire as well listy listy whatever yeah <laughs> and uh and so i did you know, introduce her to a lot of these pieces. But I will say that I, I understand why she didn't take to a lot of those those pieces. It's a challenge to write a new piece for students at a certain level on on certain instruments. And I, I will say that a lot of the repertoire that that we explored together was repertoire that was really challenging, uh, maybe not technically, but on a different, you know, level, like the mental leap that you might have to take was really hard for her. So, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's really different with the, when you add in that practical side of things, um, because a lot of students, yeah, in the early years there, it's all about the melody. It's all about learning to count and keep a time and play in tune yeah. and, um, and then, and then to, yeah, I don't know. I have I haven't yeah, and I because I focus now so much on composition teaching, I don't have like the upper level students that and that's for me too. Like it wasn't until I was quite advanced that I began exploring the 20th century repertoire. Mm -hmm. Cuz it's when you can do those techniques and you can understand music you know in a, in a more mature way, I think that that it starts to make sense. Of course, yeah. Yeah. Well, Jen, I want to thank you so much for coming in today and chatting. It's great to catch up and great to hear about some of your upcoming projects. And uh, please let me know when the album is out. Um, and uh, don't be a stranger. I'm happy to talk to you again at some point and I look forward to the next time we collaborate as well. So thanks so much. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm also looking forward to our next collaboration.